Okay, yes. great. Super. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, all of you. Um, so I'll just introduce myself briefly and then we'll get into it. So I'm Harry Sewell. I am currently director of HS Consultancy. I have a background in mental health. I was um, an ASW, as we were then, an approved mental health professional. I worked in a role initially that was half community development and half as a case carrying social worker. And that's really useful in terms of setting the scene because I was very grounded in social approaches, not just as a professional, but someone whose practice was rooted in locating people within their social context and not just responding to presenting symptoms or presenting problems. Um, and I get my last job in the statutory sector um, was as an executive director in a mental health trust in London I was on the board there for seven years and I've worked in the Department of Health and uh, in the regional part of the NHS in London. And I write and read and study issues of social justice and equality and inequality in mental health. So that's me. So my starting point is to kind of really explore um, a challenge that we have, which is if we look back over data over the last 50 years, there are disparities in our system which are quite persistent. Persistent in the context of initiatives like delivering race equality in healthcare, the DRE program as it's known. There are many other uh, initiatives like Inside Outside, and that was a precursor for that. Um, in terms of the workforce, the race, workforce race equality standards. Then you've got the EDI, um, the kind of set of measures for um, identifying levels of, you know, the approaches within organizations to equality and um, diversity, and many, many beyond that list. Even against that background, the disparities still remain the same. Uh, at one stage, it felt as though we might have turned the tide, and um, you know, just after the Delivering Race Equality um, program DRE. Um, but in fact, we realize that the data changes because of some of the changes in the structures of our health systems or some kind of social structures, but actually the overall patterns remain the same, which can be summarized that the darker skinned you are, the more likely it is you're going to be in the heavier end of services, the kind of more controlling and coercive interventions and the lighter skinned you are, the more likely it is you're going to be overrepresented in the more therapeutic ends of our services. So how can that be? That with all the initiatives bolted on, added on, we still have this intransigence in the system um, and the resistance to change, not necessarily within individuals, though there are some, but actually just in terms of the system structures. Well, I quote Don Berwick, who is the former president and chief executive of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in the States. Um, and at the launch of the NHS plan nearly 20 years ago, he said, the outcome you get from any system, the outcomes you get from any system are precisely the outcomes the system is designed to give you. And I think of psychiatry, I think of mental health, and I think, well, the fact that with all the initiatives, with all the concern we have about race disparities, we still have the patterns as they were 40 or 50 years ago, tells us that there's something about the design of the system that means we are going to deliver those kinds of outcomes. And I guess the main thing to point to here is that when we think of the system, we might think immediately of mental health or of psychiatry. But of course, psychiatry doesn't exist in isolation from the rest of our societal systems. In fact, we feed off and feed into society, we are connected, not just as in the individuals who work within the system are part of society, but actually the dominant narratives and the discourses that are replicated in society are reflective of those that exist in society. And also the way in which psychiatry conceptualizes problems also reflects the ways in which general members of the public understand or interpret the presentations that people have. So the mental health system is not a monolith. It doesn't exist in isolation. It doesn't exist um, with a firm boundary. We bleed into and out from society. So which structures um, and systems might be flawed if I ask that question? Um, you know, that the kind of underpinnings of psychiatry and mental health are flawed. Um, and then why? Why? Do we have those fundamental flaws in the system? That means we end up with these outcomes 
um, persistent over time. And when we explore that, because organizations and systems are made up of individuals, we then have to ask the question, what's the role of the professionals um, and the people who use services and communities in feeding these patterns? So for all of us, we can ask what's my role in there. Well, of course, this slide kind of represents pretty much what I was saying about the fact that the mental system exists within a wider structure, that there's society with all the kind of disparities, whether it's in education, housing, um, whether it's in higher education, you know, the interactions with the criminal justice system, the arts and media, like every walk of society, we kind of see disparities and, you know, we kind of are part of and interact with that. But the discourse, as I said before, bleeds in and out of the country. But we've also got a relationship with Big Pharma and the role of pharmaceuticals, um, both in terms of funding research and setting that kind of priority around looking for a neuroscientific route to alleviating distress um, alongside, um, you know, the political systems and the way in which, for example, if there's going to be a review of national policy around mental health or of the Mental Health Act, it would be highly surprising if the person leading that wasn't a consultant psychiatrist. We had one example of Geneva Richardson, who was a lawyer, I believe, who was leading the review of the Mental Health Act, um, and that was swept aside. And then we kind of see that the previous model of having that led by a psychiatrist um, was then the kind of emergence from that. Even that process that I was quickly outlined is a reminder that the Mental Health Act though it's a kind of piece of legislation to deal with mental distress, that it's actually a medical model. And if you look at who has power and privilege within the system of psychiatry and of mental health more broadly, then medicine is given that power, it's enshrined in our law. So even when we say, okay, our services have moved on to a biopsychosocial model, we say that against the background where enshrined in the legislation is the privilege given to a medical perspective. That is the underpinning. We kind of have, you know, the role of the AMHPs that I've referred to before, you know, that needs two recommendations from a doctor. And the idea is that we're looking for signs of a disorder that locates the issues brought by people within that framework, that conceptual framework of illness. So the mental health service is driven by a law that medicalizes pathology or medicalizes people's presentations as something pathological. So just to state explicitly what I have just said, um, there are kind of three concerns. Um, there are several, but there are kind of three. One is that we adopt individualized approaches. That's the whole premise of psychiatry, that we're looking for an illness in someone's mind and of course we might, as I said before, say we use the biopsychosocial model and try and locate people within their social context. But primarily what we're looking to do is to treat an illness in an individual. And the system is structured around that notion that that is a legitimate pursuit. And of course, if you kind of go to the book, Demedicalizing Misery, um, <clears throat> quoted there, actually the reactions to life's challenges are decontextualized and transformed into internal individual pathology. And for me, that's the biggest critique of our model of psychiatry and of mental health and any system that downplays the role of external factors and social ills is by definition going to disadvantage those people who are more exposed to those societal ills that's pretty straightforward so by definition the model of psychiatry which downplays the impact of those social circumstances disproportionately affects affects black and brown people the other idea um, that runs through the country that we can critique is that of us talking about it in a depoliticized way. Um, so often in campaigns that seek to promote greater understanding or reduce stigma and discrimination, we'll talk about the you know broken leg. We don't stigmatize or discriminate against people with a broken leg. So why discriminate against people with a broken mind as if there is equivalence? And of course, there isn't equivalence in the same way because the social structures that are highly correlated to or causally linked to the presentations in the country aren't akin to a broken leg, that the objectification of women, that the normalization of a rape culture, or as the report released a couple of days ago, um, noted the effective decriminalization of rape, 
that means not just that, but is connected to the fact that you know probably 85% of women on our acute wards are survivors of rape as babies and girls that we refer to as childhood sexual abuse and perhaps similar male gender-based violence towards women as adults. That that link with psychiatry is known to anyone in the system. We know that there's a causal relationship if you think of hearing voices, um, you know, of all the kind of societal impacts, we know that there's a dose response relationship with hearing voices. Um, and that link is clearly based on the current research causal as opposed to purely correlated to. Um, so, you know, meaning that you can say that sexual violence to babies and girls does cause hearing voices. It's not as though they're just causally, uh, that they're just um, correlated. Um, and then the third is the kind of function of the services around the three C's. So Rachel Perkins in the chapter of the book, I'm working in mental health, um, says that mental health services continue to be argued around the three C's, cure, care, and containment. And this is a fundamental flaw, potentially, that we're focusing, again, on the individual to fix them or to limit their impact on the rest of the world. And later on, I quote Rachel again about, well, you know, maybe what we need to do is to not try and get people to adapt to a sick society, but to you know think about how we can deconstruct some of the challenges within society. And some of you will know that um, I'm on the scientific board for the ESRC um, Center for Society and Mental Health. And one of the kind of primary objectives of the yeah, ESRC Society, um, Center for Society and Mental Health is to pay attention to the root causes to pay attention to the structural and systemic challenges in society that mean that particular social groups are more likely to present to our psychiatric services or even the idea of presenting to is probably subtly but incorrect um, because people don't necessarily present to you know they end up coming into contact with the services through various routes um, and some of you will know some of the racial disparities and the patterns of initial contact with our services. So why do we need to even kind of, you know, resist some of these dominant models and assumptions that underpin our system of psychiatry? Well, I guess firstly, we can kind of look to the United Nations and go to the report of the um, Rapporteur on Mental Health, who says that conceptualizing the determinants of mental health requires a focus on relationships and social connection. Great. Which demands structural interventions in society and outside the healthcare sector there is still a tendency to use individualized causal models to identify determinants of mental health, such as youth violence and self-harm. That tendency results in interventions that focus on immediate individual behavioral factors rather than, punchline, addressing the structural conditions which are the root causes. This isn't some peripheral fanciful idea, but actually with a lot of research and being the UN Rapporteur on Mental Health, I think we can kind of say that that perspective has some validity. Well, additionally, Rachel um, Perkins, who I said I was going to re-quote or quote again, states that recovery mental health, recovery focused mental health policy requires a shift from a primary focus on problem stroke symptoms removal to helping people live the lives they want to live. So that shift from the care containment treatment approach, talking about people being fulfilled um, and that kind of model of self-actualization, the things they want to do and participate as equal citizens. Therefore, it is necessary to consider not only the person so they fit in by treating the symptoms and remedying, remedying skill deficits, but changing the world so it can accommodate the person. Again, another reference to locating the challenge outside of people. Kind of going back to what I said about like the role of the system in individualizing problems is at some level we become enablers of a corrupted system. If what we do is to treat the crisis here and now and stop there, then we have to reflect on our ethical and our moral obligations. We need to think about reciprocity if we're actually taking that privilege to encounter people at the point of crisis. Is there some equally um, responsible measure we need to take to deal with the causal factors.
So too often, coming back to the UN's report, the rights-based framing of determinants is limited, viewed only by how equality affects an individual health outcome. Access to housing promotes um, the health outcomes of individuals and therefore advances the right to health. However, more work is needed to understand how the collective dimensions of the right to health not only promote individual health outcomes, but also embed a framework of equality that is not just of individual status, but also creates equal opportunities and outcomes for certain groups and society as a whole. The work of unconscious bias tells us this, depending on who's in front of us, we see or hear something different. The work of unconscious bias tells us that the biases that affect the way in which we relate to people aren't the primary criteria that inform our decisions, that there is this nudge and additionality. And it's kind of really important for us to understand that in our practice, insofar as if challenged, even if we're in self-reflection mode, we might question the actions that we've taken and the criteria that motivated them. And because there were some primary criteria informing those decisions, we might say, actually, yeah, I can see justification for why I made that decision. The work of unconscious bias, as I just said, tells us that as well as those primary criteria, we are likely to have taken into account something of the person in front of us, or at least something of our perception of that person, as well as the interaction between that perception of the other and our own selves. And for us to try and deny that there is an interaction which is occurring along those lines is a denial of what all the evidence tells us. If I were to just say, um, picture in your mind, driving down the motorway at 69 miles an hour, because of course, you know, no one's gonna be going above that in this space. Um, and through the corner of your eye, you see a police vehicle with its blue flashing lights and Beside that or alongside that police vehicle with its blue flashing lights is a BMW. And you see an old woman, maybe in her late fifties in a suit, standing there talking with a police officer with that blue light flashing beside her BMW. Now replace that image with a Rasta guy dreads down to his back, standing beside that BMW. And just think of the kind of questions or assumptions that might pop into your mind. Now, the fact that that different perception happens isn't an ill thought. It's not as though it's something bad, but what it points to is the reality that we all know is that depending on who's in a situation, we see or hear something different. Depending on who says, women will let you do anything when you're famous, you can go and grab them by their genitals and sexually assault them and you can get away with it because you're famous, they'll let you do anything. Depending on who says that, they can get away with it or not. When Trump said that, there was a backlash, but he still was the forerunner um, for the, 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 the um, election and won. I just hypothesize, and you know, it is a hypothesis, so I can't tell you it for fact, but I wonder if Barack Obama, who's painted as being black and in the discourse around that time as being seen as not completely American, with his black skin, had a tape leaked that he just kind of goes around grabbing women by their private parts and they'll let you do that. I can't imagine if a tape had been released like that, that he would have still got into the White House. Because depending on who does something, we see or hear something different. And Kahneman um, and Amos Trafersky, his colleague, developed that kind of idea of the heuristics. And you know that n notion of the halo effect um, is something that serves certain sections of our population, but it serves those people with a degree of invisibility. If you don't have barriers and you don't know they exist, well, of course, you're not gonna recognize it in yourself, but nor will you recognize that those barriers exist for others unless they tell you, unless you have the capacity to be inquisitive and to hear what others say. And in fact, there is a long history of racialized people and feminized people who have been pushing back and resisting that dominant narrative that underpins the country that I've just been talking about, the one that locates the problem 
within people's heads, the individualized approach, the way in which the experience of the social world that invades people is then pathologized. And one of the questions is to what extent do we have that capacity to hear and are open to that kind of resistance? Well, as we probably know, there are five ways in which those disparities show up in our data in England. Um, and I've kind of developed these domains to kind of capture um, those disparities. Um, domain one is the disproportionate um, experience of the antecedents of poor mental health. You're probably all familiar um, with those. It's kind of obvious in the social world if that you've got disadvantage in education, in housing, in um, access to income and wealth, um, that you're going to end up in psychiatric services more basic understanding we have. Obviously, if you're disproportionately represented in a social group that has that level of disadvantage, by definition, you're going to be disproportionately represented in psychiatric services. Easy one. Domain two, I'll explain it. Higher rates than average for utilization of services for um, or of services or for particular diagnosis. And for you and I, that's the long version of being overrepresented. And I have deliberately not used the word overrepresentation for domain two, even though that is what I'm talking about. And let me explain why. Most of us would think if you've got 10% of black people in your community and 20% on the board, that looks like overrepresentation. 10% in the community, 20% on the ward. Um, yeah, that's not okay. However, Kajwani and others, Swaran Singh, would kind of argue that that presupposes that the rates of pathology is pretty much the same across all sections of our population. But what if the levels of pathology were twice the rates of, say, white people in black people or the average rates? So let's use the kind of concept of the average. If in your black population, the rates of pathology were twice the rates of the average, then that 10%, by definition, 10% of the community would end up being 20% of your ward, unsurprisingly, because they have twice the rates of pathology. Um, so it could be argued by some that what you're seeing is a service response to need rather than overrepresentation, and that, that term overrepresentation is loaded uh, and that we need to kind of move away from that. It's a critique that I don't think is really sustained because it assumes that the country is separate from society and I've already kind of, you know, exposed my views on that kind of connectedness and the fact that we aren't just, you know, the silo that exists in isolation from the rest. Um, domain three is the reverse of what I've just articulated. Domain four is the poor outcomes derived from the treatments and interventions in mental health. And this is kind of important because, of course, we often speak in our services as though what we do has equitable benefit for everyone in our services. It's not stated explicitly, but we don't often try and tweak what we do to respond to any differences in any section of our population. But despite that, when we look at our healthcare data on an annual basis, we see that, in fact, our interventions don't have equitable out outcomes. That we look at inpatient stays, we look at repeat admissions, we realise that actually what we do on the wards doesn't tend to uh, have equitable benefit. We know um, that black and brown people have more repeat admissions. Or if you look at the average length of stay, we know that people uh, from black and brown backgrounds have longer average lengths of stay. The things that we do aren't equally effective and we don't think of changing the system to see, or maybe we do, but we don't see the actuality of that to respond to those differences. So that's one of the ways in which inequality shows up. And the main five is um, the poor experience of relationships with um, mental health services and um, professionals. And that is kind of really important because of course, we often think of you know, pharma, the kind of, you know, pharmaceuticals as being the first line of treatment. And that is a kind of solid part of psychiatry. Um, there's a science underpinning it and we kind of think that that's what works. And then we have the additional elements that are relational and we think they're important, but our first line of treatment is psychopharmacology. Well, of course, the work of Kika et al. published in 2006 identified that 50% of medication regimes fail. Of the 15%, 
of the 50%, sorry, that are successful. One of the key determining factors is the quality of the relationship between the clinician and service user. Now I'm aware that when I talk about medication regimes, that's a loaded concept and them kind of having successful failure is also loaded. But in terms of their research, the key determinant of what is successful um, is the quality of the relationship. It's worth bearing in mind when we kind of get onto that, how we conflate effectiveness with efficacy. Because if you think that only 50% of medication regimes fail, the notions we have of drugs being effective actually doesn't make that much sense if, the, um, if what we're looking at is efficacy in the clinical trials and research data, which when put into a social context, doesn't actually play out. And most of you already understand um, that notion of efficacy and effectiveness. But once we kind of get into services, that conflation happens quite routinely in people who would now otherwise um, move into that kind of territory. Um, for, uh, and I know that your link was a bit more open, um, so I'm just gonna touch on what I mean by that distinction between efficacy and effectiveness. Um, you could kind of say that you've got a antibiotic which has different levels of effectiveness when prescribed on a Wednesday compared with when prescribed on a Monday. Same drug but whether it's effective in alleviating symptoms might be different depending on the day of the week when it was prescribed. Now, of course, anyone who thinks into this can see the kind of scenario. Um, prescribed on a Monday, it's five courses. You take your five courses and you get alleviation of symptoms. Prescribed on a Wednesday and your friends say, ah, oh, it's my birthday on Friday night, you're coming out for a drink. And you think, no. Nah. And then after a bit of prompting, eventually you capitulate and you end up going out for a drink and you think, I'm just going to have soda water. And then you think, I'll just have one rosé. And then 15 wines in, you think, oh, I best stop taking the antibiotics. And of course, the course of antibiotics aren't as effective as they otherwise might have been in alleviating symptoms. There is an illustration of that kind of difference between, yeah, the efficacy might be the same in the lab, but in the social world, it has different effectiveness in alleviating the symptoms. So the challenge we have is that our data year on year shows these disparities. And each year we look at them with some feigned surprise and shock when in fact we don't do anything to completely disrupt the model we have. And one of the kind of challenges is that we add initiatives onto an unreconstructed system. So DRE or other initiatives are tried to disrupt the norms, but fundamentally the underpinning philosophies and principles and structures and approaches that guide mental health services have largely remained unchanged. If you kind of go back in time, you still have that kind of leaning to the power of the doctor, um, still the reliance on pharmaceuticals, still the models where the person who has presented or has contact with services is seen as someone who lacks capacity. I remember working with someone from what he described as a service user group um, who said, you know what, um, you and the trust, I worked in the trust, he said, you need to learn to talk to the well side. He said, everyone who presents has a well side and you all seem so obsessed with talking to the ill side. Try talking to the well side at some point. So some of the data I've, I've alluded to just to kind of get into specifics. Um, so this is data from NHS Digital looking at per 100,000 um, aggregated by ethnic group. So if you look at the darker blue, looking at um, the 2018-19 data, per 100,000, the detention rates are at 306.8. Um, if you look at the equivalent for white people, it's 72.9. I mean, you just need to look at the chart. I don't even need to tell you the numbers. And you can see that the variations we're talking about are quite significant. It isn't as though there are kind of marginal differences between groups. Something happens. And that book by Eduardo Bernilla Silva, that kind of points to racism without racists, kind of comes to mind because if we think, I don't know of any professionals who come into our mental health services with the intent on causing harm and with the intent of being racist and disadvantaging black and brown people. So we have to kind of be curious about, well, what is it that means that people who are black and brown have these detrimental outcomes, or at least these variations that are quite significant when there's no one in the system who is intentionally trying to create those conditions. 
I'm not going to spend too long on this particular slide. I'm just kind of pulling out some of the key data on it. Um, so if you look at detention rates, which reflects what I've said on the previous slide, uh, African people are three times more likely than their um, white counterparts to be compulsory detained. Um, Black Caribbean people are four times more likely. Hell, you got kids, you got family members who are black, and you're looking at them thinking, yeah, four times more likely than your yeah, mate to end up in psychiatric care under detention. Um, the admission to forensic, five times their number in the general population. I mean, these are heavy numbers. CTOs, community treatment orders. Black communities are eight times more likely to be placed on a CTO. Look at the um, rates of diagnosis for psychosis. 3.2% for black men compared with 0.3% for white men and one3 for Asian men. And then, you know, you've got data there on use of talking or access to talking therapies and the length of stay on acute inpatient wards. Um, which are longer, um, as I've already said, even when adjusted for diagnosis. Whichever way you cut the data, whichever way you look at it, that pattern that I've said, the darker skinned you are, the more likely it is you're going to be in the more coercive parts of services. And it is true that if you look purely at first time contact with services, you'll see these kind of patterns. But if you go way back to a paper published, published um, in the British Medical Journal, authored by Swaran Singh and colleagues, um, they identified that, in fact, after first contact, the deterioration continues, i.e., if you look at everyone who's got their first contact, you'll find that there is a high representation, a disproportionately high representation of people from Black and Asian backgrounds, and that is true. But that pattern gets worse if you look at people who have had a third or fourth or fifth stay on our wards. And what that kind of tells us is that, yeah, we might initially be able to say, well, there are things happening further upstream that drive these disparities. But once people are in psychiatry and we know the social world in which they live, if we know that and we offer interventions, but it still gets worse over time, it's really hard to deny that there is some culpability on the system. I used to, 15 years ago, use the illustration of the way in which our services operate a bit like in an accident and emergency department. If we said we offer fair services and what we do is we get everyone who comes through the doors of a &E to pull a ticket. You just pull your ticket, you've got a number in it, you wait your turn and it's absolutely fair. And then at the end of each shift, you go, wow, those people who got stabbed or those people in a road traffic accident, they seem to die. And we don't really know what's going on because we have these fair approaches. And that nonsense illustration makes the point that offering the same thing to people when you know that they arrive with a greater degree of complexity doesn't make sense. We can't, on the one hand, say we know that people who are black and brown come in with a greater degree of complexity because of the social world that they live in and the kind of disparities um, that are pre-existing. We can't say that and then say, but our response is going to be fair because we provide the same to everybody. Those two lines of arguments just don't stack up. But we insist on models of services that on the one hand notices, and then on the other hand does, now I see you, now I don't. Now I see that you're black, and in a minute I don't. So some of you will be familiar with this slide comparison. Um, on the left, you've got the data from the CAM services that identifies that young black people in CAM services, child and adolescent mental health services, are underrepresented. And then the data on the right points to the fact that by the time we get to adult mental health services, um, and this is looking at people um, who are detained under the Act, um, you see that there's a kind of overrepresentation, particularly of black populations. And we can throw out the question, and I know there are people who hypothesize about why it might be that when people are young, they're not picked up even though we know that a large proportion of the people who end up arriving in adult mental health services had some kind of signs of emerging challenges, even if it was emotional disturbance from the time that they were younger. And it kind of raises this question whether or not, as I said before, we see something different depending on who's in front of us. Do we see a young white woman who self-harms by cutting as showing symptoms 
of some kind of emotional mental distress and have a service response but if we see a young black boy who at 13 ends up carrying a knife and interacts in a setting where it's effectively placing themselves in harm's way that we see that as deviance rather than seeing that as a consequence of someone who lives in a social circumstance where they've been groomed to place themselves at excessive risk. Do we have models that have inbuilt into them different assumptions about what pain looks like? At the heart of the disparities are these underpinning beliefs. So this um, is a reference to when I was talking about that distinction between the language of higher than average rates rather than overrepresentation, and the explanation given um, by some of the researchers, um, Gashwani et al. The BME disproportionality in detention rates seems to be due to higher rates of mental illness, greater risk and poorer levels of social support rather than ethnicity per se. Hence my point about on this occasion, well, it isn't that the services are being discriminatory based on race, um, it's something else. What we do know, however, is that skin color and race does make a difference. There was work by Cantor Gray, um, a meta-analysis that looked at different migrant groups around the world and noted that actually, you know, all migrant groups have excess use of mental services. But when you then put them in rank order, the groups who have the largest degree of disparity are darker skinned people. And there's work in the Netherlands that kind of pointed to the same thing um, by Veiling et al. published in 2007. That skin color actually is a key determinant of people's experiences. It's not the only explanation because of course, there's gonna be intersections between race and social class, but it's worth recognizing that skin color does matter, race does matter. So in a paper that seeks to remove, to put a veil over the actual purposefulness of race, in the argument um, is actually denying the reality. That denial is perhaps part of what happens when we interact with individuals in our service, that when we see presenting problems, that what we see are social factors that might be driving uh, individual presentations. We might understand traumas in people's lives that we can point to. But what we fail to see sometimes are those things built into systems and structures in society that create some of the disparities that you might not be able to say there's a causal relationship, but there are these clusters of things that mean that certain people are going to have disadvantages in the external world that then invade who they are, which unsurprisingly leads to some contact with psychiatric services. If we fail to fully incorporate that knowledge into our approach with people, then by definition, we downplay the impact of the external world on people. Um, and as I say, if we've got a system that's designed on looking for discrete and individualized illnesses in people's heads, by definition, we downplay the impact of that social world. You're probably all kind of <laughs> being, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I realize it is an intense um, presentation, but I'm going to, uh, in fact, I'm going to pause there for a minute, just in case anyone wants to breathe and ask a question. Remember, you need to unmute. I, I'm going to leave my questions for, for later because I'm writing frantically and I, okay. uh, I will kill the, kill the flow. But if okay. any, anyone else wants to ask something, go ahead, guys. Going once, going twice gone okay so i was just then talking about race uh, as a determinant in people's experiences and understanding that we need to think of intersectionality because of course people are more than just their race they could be someone who's gay um someone who um is disadvantaged socioeconomically um you know someone who's disabled there could be a multiplicity of factors but race is a feature that does have an impact and this particular exploration um, today is really to say, well, let's some pay attention to how race and racism plays out in people's lives, um, because unless we can name it and identify it, then we won't be able to attend to it. So what we do know is that the concept of race as a biological um, entity is fundamentally flawed. We've all got 25 to 30,000 genes. The largest difference between us is less than 0.1 of a percent. We know that there's no consensus um, on what the racial groups are. 
if you go around the world, people have different ways of naming different racial groups. I could even ask you, would you put a black Ugandan or a black South African in the same racial group as an Algerian who's lighter skinned or a Moroccan? Where would you put someone who's um, an Omari from New Zealand or original Australian? What about some light skinned Brazilians who you might not think are white, but there's something else. Are they also black? Or how do, how do we understand race? And when you get into it, you realize that actually there is no consensus about what the racial groups are. Largely, when we think of race, we think that by looking at skin color, shape of nose, hair texture, shape of the skull, shape of the eyes, that we can look at that cluster of features and then determine the race to which people belong. But in fact, we know that that's an unreliable measure because how did we even get here? What we know is that there was a time when the characteristics that we associate with race didn't have the same meanings that they have today. Then we kind of got into the Middle Ages and then you kind of had um, the travel across seas, which meant that people were seeing uh, individuals who were largely different, um, this desire to commoditize human life so that we could kind of buy and sell. Um, linked to the exploits by um, Christopher Columbus. And please don't confuse his travels with discovering places. I'm hoping that by now everyone's realized that you don't turn up to a place and find people there and be awarded the title of having discovered it. Um, but around that time, that desire to commoditize human life led to people like Carl Linnaeus, who's just one of many, who developed these classification systems, these taxonomies that sought to put people within these boundaries that they refer to as races and that that was based very much on those kind of characteristics that I alluded to on a previous slide that there was no kind of real science to it other than biases held within people and what's important in understanding that is that not only were the racial groups identified with a set of characteristics ascribed to individual groups, but also the notion of a hierarchy was explicitly stated. So I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna say it as clearly as I can. At no point in our recent history was the concept of race neutral, at no point. And even if you look, you know, 100 years on, Knox gave a speech in Edinburgh saying race stampeth for man, male gender pronoun. The idea that you can determine everything about an individual based on their race. We haven't moved far from that notion where we meet people and in that immediate interaction, something in our minds, either consciously or unconsciously, tells us that we have a sense of what this person is gonna bring into that dynamic with us. And largely, we deal with that long shadow of history that has taught us to believe that we live in a world that is hierarchical based on race, that it isn't just hierarchical in some random way. Wherever you go around the world, you will always find that the closer the proximity to whiteness or whiteness itself is always seen at the top of that tree. You don't have, maybe you can tell me, a notion around the world where darker skin ends up being at the top. And that notion that has been passported and sometimes intentionally, for example, through the use of images like the image that settlers would take of Jesus to say, this is your deity, worship this deity. Isn't it really amazing? That deity looks like me with blonde hair and blue eyes. When all of us know that if Jesus looked like that walking around Jerusalem at the time he was on earth and he looked like that, we'd see books and books written about this person who mysteriously disappeared out of nowhere with blonde hair and blue eyes and pale skin. So some of that messaging has been intentional. So we start with this classification system that has a hierarchy and then you look out your window and I can ask you, can you see evidence of a racial hierarchy in your everyday life? Look in the criminal justice system, look in parliament, look in any profession, look in education, look in who holds professoral roles. Can you see a hierarchy? It'd be really hard, really, really hard to deny that when we look out there, we don't get messages in that way that we live in a world where there's a hierarchy with white people at the top. Further, if you look at our education and you think what knowledge has been privileged, you go back through your studies in um, psychology and think about 
the knowledges that have informed the perspectives you have on the human condition. And tell me any that hasn't haven't emerged from the global north. As you frame your perception of what human distress looks like, human struggles. And then you realize when you start to explore that, how even our education, you can take it back to your schooling, how our education has unconsciously made us accustomed to the notion that whiteness can be equated with those who discover, who build, who have knowledge, who find solutions for some of the world's intractable problems. Because as you know, we often learn not only by what we are told and what we see by what we don't see. You create an absence of something and what you perhaps unintentionally communicate is that by their absence, it means that they don't have a presence and that lack of presence is because they don't have something to contribute. And when you do that, and you do that in a world where it isn't only white people who get that message about who has dominance and who is the pinnacle, but also people of black and brown backgrounds are also living in a world where they're seeing these images and that discourse, including our educational system, that tells them somewhere about where they fit in that hierarchy. Once you start to kind of understand that we live in a racially racialized world that is hierarchical, you start to kind of get into, well, how do social inequalities play out in people's lives? What chance do you have? If you're white and you had a choice whether you're um, going to adopt or whether you're thinking of procreating and you had a choice to have a child and if you were to think purely on the basis of you want to bring into the world or to bring up someone who has the best chance of success that you've done well and you want to think who if I was going to measure success purely on who's going to have the best chance of getting on in society, would you say, if you were going to choose, you would choose a black child? Not anything about your values. That's not what I'm asking. I'm saying if your pure measure is, based on what I know about the world, who do I think has the best chance of succeeding? It would be insanity to suggest that you think, given that choice, that if you said, you know, a black child, you really think, given everything we know about society, that a black child has the greater degree um, or the greater possibility of success. We all kind of know. We know we live in a world where your skin colour is a key determinant on your possibilities. And that one of the greatest acts of power is to ensure that people internalise that knowledge for themselves. When you can remove the chains but allow people to internalise those concepts and limit their own aspirations because they have no belief that they can achieve great things then you can stand by and say this has nothing to do with me look what you're doing to yourself when those same people look around the world and say why would i believe anything different why would i believe that i can kind of get to particular levels because the world tells me i can't whether it's in the films and the books in my education at school whether it's in the casual conversation whether it's the banter that happens in the office or amongst my friends all kind of tells me that chances are i'm not going to get there and there is something about how that impedes our resilience against distractions and pushbacks. Because people might start with the intention of trying to get somewhere. And if you really think there is a possibility that you might get there, then you dig in deep and you think, yeah, any athlete knows that you come off the turn and you look down the home straight and you think, yeah, I could probably catch that person. Or I can fend off the person behind me and you think, yeah, yeah, you dig in deep and it burns but you push through because you think, yeah, maybe I could. You come off that turn and someone's like 40 metres down and you kind of think, hell no way I'm going to catch them. Why are you going to burn your legs out? You kind of think, okay, fine. That notion of if you really aren't convinced that there's a possibility that the there is equity in possibilities for you, faced with challenge and interruptions of your pursuit, you're more likely to acquiesce in what others might consider to be failure. All these factors emerge from that racial hierarchy in which we live. But as I say, it wasn't always like this. There's a book called White on Black, and Peter says, the earliest images of black Africans are significant in the genealogy of European images we encounter in ancient Egypt. The oldest representations of black Africans dating from 2500 BC show them well integrated into society and intermarrying. 
I put this up there because it's easy for us to kind of think, but yeah, we've always had a race, we've always seen the world like this. No, we haven't. Finally, on this topic, um, I give voice to Adam Rutherford's work, How to Argue with the Racist, published earlier on this year. Of all the attempts over the centuries to place humans into distinct races, none succeeds. Genetics refuses to comply with these artificial and superficial categories. Skin color, whilst being the most obvious difference between people, is a very bad proxy for the total amount of similarity or difference between individuals and populations. Racial differences are skin deep. So we live in this world where there's a paradox. Race doesn't really exist other than a social construction. That's what that tells us. But race absolutely exists in our human interactions and in our social world. And not only does this thing that doesn't really exist other than a social construction, it also plays out viciously in the outcomes in our mental health services. Hell of a challenge. So going back to that notion of well, racism, the first act of racism any of us perform is to believe or to articulate the notion that there are races. By definition, if we're referring to a term that has inherent within it the concept of a hierarchy, by us buying into the notion of race, we are effectively buying into the fact that we might not consciously, but we buy into the notion of a hierarchical world based on race. We're all corrupted in it, we're all in it. And I kind of say that because it's kind of helpful when I speak like this and I speak with such persuasion and power that I don't stand outside of this challenge. I've always been really honest about that. This is a, a, a fight, this is a concern of mine as much as it is yours. Um, so, yeah, once we buy into that notion, we buy into that concept of racism. And it's therefore helpful to make a shift in our minds away from thinking of people as belonging to a race, but rather thinking of people who have been racialized, that we create the notion of race, we create these assumptions about what that means, and then it becomes internalized by those very people who then get to a point of embracing that concept of race that has been applied to them, even though it doesn't really exist. So there aren't people, they're not people who belong to a race, but people who have been racialized to see themselves in particular ways. And that's useful because when we look at the challenges as they present to mental health services, it's helpful if we don't think that there's something intrinsic about this person, why those disparities are apparent, but rather there's something in that process of them having been racialized that means that we see these disparities. It takes longer to say it, but it doesn't take any longer to think it conceptually. I'm not looking at a person who is just ill and ill more than anybody else. I'm looking at a person who has faced multiple traumas, largely based on both interpersonal and systemic forms of racism, completely woven into structures, which you can kind of see getting played out in the COVID pandemic. And what's also helpful to note about the um, pandemic is that if you look at each individual person who presents with COVID from a black or brown background, you might not look at it and point and go, wow, that's racist COVID. That person's suffering from COVID racism. You see COVID and you treat COVID, but the pattern tells us there's something going on and we kind of know that, yeah, people who work on the front line, work in our health and social care services, um, who are at lower grades, people in jobs like security or in the retail sector where their interaction with people more face greater degrees of risk or people who live with a lot more people in their households um, also might face greater degrees of risk. There are so many factors that interplay with each other to lead to the kind of disparities that we see in the COVID data. The point being that it isn't a biology per se, it isn't about them. It's about the social world in which they live. And those factors come together, they coalesce, and we see that in the data. That isn't dissimilar from what happens in psychiatry, but the challenge is similar insofar as mm, when someone presents, we might not be able to go, all right, so this person's mental health presentation is to do with racism, but we look at the data and we think something's happening. And the challenge, and this is my phrase of 2020, 
we need to make invisible those things that were previously invisible to us. Whether it is the privilege given to knowledge from the global north, whether it is the kind of impact on self-esteem and the kind of belief in self-actualization, whether it's about different social networks that people may not have access to, the difference between income and wealth, that seems to be invisible to most people. That gets played out in, yet someone might be able to kind of, you know, get up to a senior level. But what if you're the only member in your family in your social network who gets up to that level? What's it like surviving in isolation when your peers might actually come up through a generation where your siblings or your cousins or other people in your social networks also have risen to that level, if that's where we conceptualise seniority? And if you're struggling, you've got a problem, you've got someone you can kind of go and have a conversation with and try and figure it out. If you're in isolation, then that income that you might be getting doesn't translate to wealth particularly if it also means that you're doing that in a smaller house where you don't have the luxury of a study where you don't have the luxury of having inherited property enough times to go and do your masters by remortgaging your house and taking the equity out and either paying for your course or choosing to work four days a week um, and topping up your ongoing income with some of that equity there are things that affect people and those kind of differences that are often invisible until on the other occasion, you might say, well, can you take the call? Can you go to the study? And you realize that this person doesn't have a study. And I'm not saying that this is purely along the lines of white or black. I'm saying that there are patterns in there. And that difference between income and wealth is one that most people don't even consider as a key differential, because we look at the current day and we see that people are getting on without a real appreciation of the social context from which they come. So anti-racism um, in our practice requires us to challenge that notion of the racial hierarchy. One endorses either the idea of a racial hierarchy as a racist or racial equality as an anti-racist. One either believes problems are rooted in groups of people as a racist, which is kind of often what we do in our healthcare systems where we're you know, carrying out loads of initiatives to understand the other, or it locates the roots of the problems in power and policies as an anti-racist. Can you see the link there with the report from the UN that's kind of saying you look into society, you look at those systems and structures, and you can find the roots there rather than in just people and in their heads. One either allows racial inequalities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequalities as an anti-racist. To what extent do you, do I, in our practice, sit on the fence and be non-political and be non-racist? Or do we say, actually, we live in a world that creates these massive disparities. That means chances are that's having an impact on the people that I see. And to what extent do we bring that um, into um, our dialogue? This slide is just kind of talking about specificity rather than lashing out at the system. So... Racisms, there are many forms. There's the overt, there's the covert. So that's like when people know, um, but they want to kind of have plausible deniability and say it isn't because of that. Whatever it is, a bit like Churchill um, had the policies to say, you know, let's keep black and brown people out. We want to have an open door around immigration. And that's the message. But to hardwire into the system some obstacles that mean that black and brown people will increasingly trip over those barriers and be kept out without it being evident that the intention was to be racist. That's kind of what I mean by covert. Um, intersecting between environmental racism and capitalism and kind of our understanding of how that happens. For example, each time we choose to upgrade our mobile phone, the role that that plays in I know causing environmental strife, um, civil conflict, and uh, poverty in places like Democratic Republic of Congo, where we go and rip resources out that multinationals then use to build their empires, whilst local people are finding a that the climate crisis disproportionately affects them and they remain poor whilst we get our devices. That kind of intersecting between our everyday actions and racism that isn't intentional by any means, but the systems and processes that we use routinely have that contributory factor. That's a form of racism. 
the institutional form that you'll be familiar with in policies and practices, um, when we just are non-racist. We say we don't see color, we don't see race. And by doing that, you're kind of saying to someone, well, you know what? Uh, I know all the evidence tells me that you live in a world that treats you really differently and harshly because of who you are, but uh, conveniently, I'm going to pretend that we all live in a meritocracy and you have the same opportunities and possibilities like me. It's convenient because it means you don't have to do the work. But in that bystander role, we become complicit with the system. Hence the acquiescence of racism. Then we get into non-validation in our individual practice and that notion of toxic interaction theory and the unconscious bias there. There's a long history of racism. Um, I said about the kind of building of the knowledge that informs um, psychiatry and psychology, and you needn't look further than Suman Fernandez's book called uh, Institutional Racism in Psychiatry and Clinical Psychology, and you can kind of find many examples of how the very fundamental beliefs and assumptions under our psi disciplines are built on notions that are racist, and how our disciplines have been used through generations as a means of social control. Um, we know of Samuel Cartwright's model of Japatomania, the diagnostic category of slaves, African-American slaves that run away from plantations. And of course, why would you want to do that? Sign of madness, clearly. Um, you look at Jonathan Metzl's book on unprotest psychosis, how schizophrenia became a black disease, and you can kind of see how there was a rise in the representations of schizophrenia being related to blackness, whereas previously it was something more associated with white middle class housewives. And then in the 1980s, the notion of cannabis psychosis, which was used almost exclusively for African Caribbean young people, largely men, when of course there was no real evidence of differences in the people who were smoking cannabis based purely on ethnicity or race. But that diagnosis was given almost exclusively to black people. Here's an excerpt from um, an image from Jonathan Metzl's book. That's what I'm saying. The pharmaceuticals in collusion with psychiatry at the time. We kind of present the idea that schizophrenia was about uncommunicative, uncommunicative um, lonely housewives, um, which then became this by um, the late 60s and 70s of a representation of what schizophrenia is about and what Haloperidol could do um, by controlling some of the kind of reactions and we can kind of ask ourselves, what do we do now that uses our discipline as a means of social control where people might be angry with some of the kind of things like the objectification of women or kind of, you know, decriminalization of rape effectively. To what extent do we use our diagnostic categories of EUPD or other models to silence people who have a voice? So lastly, lastly, talking about, um, that kind of thing of toxic interaction theory. I want to bring our attention to the relationship. This is a quote from Julian Lasada, who's talking to a group of therapists. And he said, it seems to me we must take seriously the possibility that the caring professions from which we take our recruits are moving towards a state of mind, which is to all intents and purposes, scared of relationships, of feelings, of being too closely linked to their clients. It's a state of mind that attributes therapeutic benefit to outcome and not the relationship that provides a container for it. How many of us have got key measures, tools, outcomes that we need to feed into the system to demonstrate the value of what we're doing? And in doing so, we're looking down. We're looking down, filling out advice, filling out a form. Our focus is on getting to that endpoint, getting to that outcome that we need to achieve. I even heard once that a particular trust was suggesting that frontline, frontline workers had recovery outcomes and um, recovery indicators, sorry. How can we kind of transmogrify um, a framework of recovery from being something emerging from the so-called service user movement to something that we then turn into a framework and develop KPIs around it? That notion, that obsession with outcomes, our interactions is focusing on that and not the relationship. And maybe that is one of the challenges in our service toxic interaction theory kind of identifies that when we get black and white or we even get people who are black within the service interacting with people who are black or from other minority background as a service user in that space, 
we can ask, what do we bring into the space? Because people will come with their prior microaggressions, their experiences of discrimination, both structural in the ways I've described and also interpersonal. And that will bring up for them some perception about who you are and whether you're going to attend to it. And as workers, we might bring into that space our anxiety, our concerns about um, getting it wrong. And yeah, us kind of walking on eggshells around it. And what do we do in that space? And I can't say this. If we think it's difficult to bring race and racism into the space because we don't want to bring it out, we don't want to be the one to raise it and we want to be service user led and we use that as our out. Do we do that with suicidal ideation? Do we go, you know what? This person hasn't mentioned it, so I'm just going to not mention it because I don't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable. If you do that, I'm really worried about the people you work with. And the reason why we're so convinced that even if that person doesn't bring it into the space, we must, even though we're being person-led, is because we know that it has a key determination on the outcome. If we can kind of engage them in those conversations, have you got means? How intent are you? We can work with it because we know it matters. If we think that there is legitimacy in not bringing into the space our knowledge of the impact of structural racism and interpersonal racism on people's mental health, then effectively we are denying their reality and we're also acting as if we don't think that is relational or detrimental to people's mental health problems. And the thing about it is sometimes people who experience forms of discrimination don't even have a language or conceptualization for it. The kind of stuff about how educational systems feed that hierarchy. Sometimes people don't have a language for that. And we could conveniently just leave it up to them or we could actively put that into the space. And toxic interaction theory is all about that. That when we intentionally or because we're just shy, choose to not put into the space our knowledge of the social circumstances of people who experience structural and interpersonal racism, then there is something toxic about that relationship because we sit there and we inadvertently locate the problem in people's heads with intentional or unintentional denial of their social reality. And then we look at the data and we ask ourselves, how do we have racism without racists?